Hey everyone, welcome to episode 55 of The Nerd Nest. I'm Bill, and on today's show, I'm joined by Carrie and Russ, as well as special guest Adam Patrick Murray. He is the host of the Full Nerd Podcast and head of video at PC World. On the episode, we talked about how Microsoft and PlayStation are basically competing to see who can be the most hated company in gaming right now. We talked about an amazing week when it comes to indie games. We speculated about Nintendo's plans for the Super Switch, plus the nerd test and a lightning round. It was a fantastic episode and it starts right now. I feel like right now, there are two versions of the video game industry. There's, there's, you know, one that's going amazingly well. And then the other one is a disaster dumpster, dumpster fire. And this week feels like the perfect example of both of those existences happening simultaneously in the gaming industry. And I wanted to talk about that. So, uh, I want to start off with uh, Carrie. Uh, let's let's start with the Microsoft stuff, and I want to. St I mean, look, we gotta we gotta we gotta hold Microsoft's feet to the fire. They just shut down. I think it was four studios, right? Not just two. Yeah, there was four, and I think one of them the they got merged into uh, ESO or something. So the the studio that was there. They don't. The studio doesn't exist anymore, but it can't kind of like merged into another studio or something. Effectively, still four studios. Yeah, and uh, the the ones that everybody was paying close attention to was uh, Arcane Austin and uh, um, uh, Tango GameWorks. Uh, Arcane yeah. Austin recently had uh, shipped Redfall, and right. Tango GameWorks recently had shipped uh, Hi-Fi Rush. Two very different. Uh, experiences, you know, Hi-Fi Rush is this single player game that, you know, was a shadow drop during one of their directs. And then um, our, um, Redfall was, you know, this multiplayer focused uh, games as a service style game. And both of those studios get shut down. And I, I, I saw a lot of people that were like saying, well, it makes sense for Arcane Austin to get shut, shut down because of Redfall. But I mean, what are you doing with uh, Tango GameWorks. What was your reaction when you saw this, Kerry? Um, all right, so I, I, I'm i typically pro Microsoft. I, I like a lot of Microsoft stuff and the things that they do. It's hard to defend anything that they're doing right now. They have infinite money, and yet they're still closing down studios as if it matters to them at all, which I don't think it would at all. Uh, so you have you know Arcane Austin, and a lot of people are like, well, they're probably the B team and whatever. And I saw a lot of discourse in that. And someone put the kibosh on that from Lion Arcane and saying that, no, they, they're they you know pretty much working together on a lot of things like Sonored. Um, and then they started doing their own games and stuff. And Redfall, I will never pin on Arcane Austin at all. I, you know, Redfall is definitely a games as a service thing, which every studio has been forced to do uh, across the board. Everyone is doing all the AAA studios because that's where the cash cow is. And it doesn't matter if they know that they can't possibly be something that is sustainable from any degree that you look at it, because there's only so much time that people have within whatever they're going to do. So you're almost setting out with the idea that 95% of these are just going to crash and burn. And the, I think the tweet I put out there was just like, uh, you know, you see the, 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 the black text with the white border that has just been sending out for everything. That's just bad news. And I was like, you know, management was like, oh, you guys are going to make a gas game. It's like, well, we don't want to do that. It's like, yeah, but you're still going to do it. Oh, you guys messed up real bad. Why did you do that? This is going to look real bad on you. And it's it, management up or, you know, anyone that has made that decision is not accountable at all. And it's frustrating. It's super frustrating to see that happen. It's like, first, you guys could pay for it. Second, it wasn't them that wanted to do that. And you're, ah, it's, there's nothing redeemable at this at all. And the, the next event that they're going to have, this is probably Microsoft's biggest year in terms of games that's coming anytime soon mm -hmm. for them. So they have like Indiana, Indiana Jones that's coming. Uh, there's talk of a new Doom that's coming. There's lots of stuff that they're going to be showing up. Their, their pregame stuff for June is going to look huge. They might be doing some more stuff with Activision where that stuff comes in the Game Pass. And I can't help but feel like any hype I could possibly have for that is completely deflated based on what they've done here. 
And even what they did to Tango Gameworks, this is something that Microsoft has tried. With the 360, they tried real hard. They tried going into uh, into Japan, the launch day and date on the 360 in Japan. They funded a lot of titles. You have Blue Dragon, Lost Odyssey. There's lots of stuff that they tried getting into that uh, region, but the region just didn't want that. So they're sort of peeling back and they finally get in a studio that's in Japan that could do that type of stuff so that they could have some type of titles that could appeal to those type of people on the Xbox platform. And then they're just like, so long. You guys did great. Uh, we, we tried, we tried saddlebagging you by totally <laughs> like silent launching. They're like, just up oh, here we go. Shadow drop. Here it goes. And everyone's like, whoa, shadow drop. This game's yeah. awesome. And for me, I was like, oh, man, maybe if this is going to be a thing that they do. They'll always just have like a shadow drop that's going to be super awesome and huge. And it turns out, no, they don't. They just tried to like, you know, <laughs> shove that under the rug and it just it backfired in their face. And they're like, oh, <laughs> what are we going to do now? But the thing and, is, uh, it's like we don't really know if it backfired because like Aaron Greenberg, right. VP of Xbox marketing, said that it hit all of their key metrics. Right. I mean, at some point, I, I don't believe anything that anyone ever says ever. So like whenever you hear some mouthpiece saying something, I just genuinely think uh, they're not telling us the whole truth. Even when you had Sarah Bond be like, hey, uh, happy anniversary, guys. Many more years to come. Like a few months before she just, you know, crapped them out. Like I'm not saying it was her alone, but like certainly she should have known something was up. And at what time, at what point do you like, you know, you no longer keep up appearances that interview she had with Bloomberg was <sighs> cool, man. That was brutal because you saw her. She had no good answer for anything. And even her body language, which a lot of people had talked about and I agree with, looked like she was voicing everything she could possibly say through her body language alone. It was it's brutal. This is whatever they're doing isn't necessary. And they are shooting themselves in the foot. And it is entirely a Microsoft decision. The entire xbox team you know that you had like even before jay allard and, and those guys uh same as Backley and uh they all those guys that like started xbox and the ragtag team that made xbox what it was is long gone and uh you know it was it was apparent in like 2008 and 2009 when uh, don matrick joined and it's just been it's not been anything that they've been able to recover from i did honestly think that uh, like phil was trying to try to bring something back for xbox and i still think that he would like to do that but you know when you have the parent company just be like well we we are fully adopting this now uh just do what we say uh you know pound salt i i don't there's nothing that i could say that is defending them they, this is a bad situation for them and i don't know I, I don't know it's hard for any type of fan of xbox to want to participate in helping them succeed at all when I don't think anyone really wants them to succeed. We, I think there's a lot of people that used to be that like, you just like the Sony contingent that wanted them to fail. But now you have people that on the Xbox side be like, you know what? You guys can go up in flames. It's a, it's a bad time right now for them. So Adam, I have a question like for, for the, for these situations where you have a game that was performing, I, well, we have no idea how it was performing, but what we do know is that, like everybody was very hyped about that game, uh, Hi-Fi Rush, and then it was over really quick. And when you when you sell a game, well, then money's coming in. But when you just have people subscribing to Game Pass, that could be what the real issue is. So you know we have this question, and I'm going to start with you, Adam, on this for for Game Pass. Um, that is from Nicholas DeLeon. They said, "Has have Game Pass and Steam sales done more harm than good for the industry? What do you think about that? Uh, good question. Uh, but I, I, I see those as two completely different things. I, I'm going to assume they're talking about for the PC space specifically or, mm -hmm. or maybe just Game Pass in general. Uh, I don't... I personally have not heard of too many people who subscribe to just PC Game Pass. Usually it's, oh, hey, Game Pass Ultimate, and I get the whole kit and caboodle kind of thing. Uh, yeah. So, like, that's different. I don't know. I'm, I'm not a business person. I'm not good with the money end of stuff, but it seems like the whole Game Pass model is is a fun thing. And, hey, it was good for, for people. 
uh, you know, the actual gamers using it, it is a great deal. But on the back end, yeah, maybe it's it's hard to to justify. Uh, I mean, if anything, it doesn't it doesn't remind me of the Steam sales. It, it reminds me more of uh, Epic Games when they were trying to push their launcher and like paying out all this money to get free games on the service and get people into that ecosystem. And then after a while, they're like, okay, well, even free games aren't getting people to buy games on on Epic Games. So. <laughs> I, I, I kind of equated a little bit more to that mm -hmm. uh, than Steam sales. I actually think Steam sales are a good thing um, because you can you can capitalize on the diehard people who want to get there day one, uh, but then you get a ton of people who are always looking for deals uh, on Steam. And like I, I just feel like it's commonly known that Steam is the place to to find really good deals. And so I you know I I think developers kind of go knowing like go in know, knowing that and kind of have or sh maybe the best ones should have like a plan of like okay we're going to launch at this and then at this point we're going to be able to discount and then maybe a little bit further down the line we get a real big discount and get another bump uh i i see it a, a little bit more as like an established game where game pass the epic game store that's all like new experiments that are just like okay you know maybe that didn't work out do you, so do you feel like game pass you know steam sales aside do you feel like game pass is a failure or bad for the industry because you get these games that come to game pass and everybody tries them real quick but then they don't stick around and so as soon as they drop off that you know everybody's playing this game it's like the, the it's like the the sales didn't count almost yeah that's hard i mean i i I feel like it's like there's so many different situations. Hi-Fi Rush is an example. I mean, another one that, that comes to mind is like Power World. Like I remember when everyone was talking about Power World, like I, I was like, oh, it's on Steam, uh, you know, that price. And, uh, and then I was like, oh, it's over on Game Pass. OK, let me try it out for 10 minutes. And I realized that that this is not a game for me. So I didn't play <laughs> it further than that. But uh, one of my coworkers, Willis, uh, he got Game Pass specifically because all the Yakuza games were on there. And he just like cranked you know dozens and dozens of hours like through the yakuza series and he was like hell yeah this was awesome uh you know i don't know financially how feasible it was on the back end for the developers but i mean for for people i, I people like it i yeah i i don't know i uh, is it a good thing for the industry god i don't know i don't know i i mean i guess not because it doesn't seem like it's like sustainable but I mean, it was good for players at least. Do you feel like it's uh, sustainable, Russ? I, you know, I feel a lot like Adam where it's like, we don't have all the information to see whether or not like, you know, are the development studios getting some sort of payback or, you know, some sort of, some sort of benefit out of this because it is so pro consumer that I worry that, yeah, it's, it's, it's undercutting the individual value of these games. Basically like if, if I can just see it on game pass, all of a sudden, I don't know what it is about me. I'm a very fickle gamer, first of all, right? But when I pick up Game Pass and I look at them, I'm like, okay, well, these, these are games I will never buy because I can just get them right here. Right. And that's already like a sale that they've lost. And then other times I look at it and I go, oh, man, I already bought this game and now it's on Game Pass. You know what I mean? Like I could have saved money there. And so it's one of those where it is undercutting the value of those games. And so I do worry about that. And I want to make sure that, yeah, that these games are getting their return on investment. And I think Hi-Fi Rush is a great example. I didn't buy that game. I played several hours of it. I never paid for it because it was on Game Pass. And if I'm like every other gamer out there, then maybe the sales for Hi-Fi Rush weren't really there. Like how many people were buying it as opposed to just using it on Game Pass? And so, yeah, well, I don't know. Actually, it's funny. I'm, I'm, I'm on the opposite end where I had Game Pass, but I... I, I like I was like ah, I kind of wanted to just have it on Steam, <laughs> so like <laughs> like like I I actually rarely used my Game Pass except for like to mm. to try out some, some things here and there. Most of the time I was like oh if it's something I really want I'm just gonna go ahead and give them money and put it on Steam. I mean but hey I'm I'm yeah. older I got more disposable income so you know it, it's like that's just how I like to roll so I don't know. <laughs> I feel <laughs> like weird. Adam you're no. a you're a unicorn like. Most people, if they subscribe to Game Pass and a game is on Game Pass, there's no way that they're forking over extra money for it. And it's commendable that you do that, but I just can't see most people doing that. I did that two weeks ago with Manor Lords only because I didn't realize it was on Game Pass. I bought it. Mm -hmm. I was enjoying it. 
Carrie told me it's on Game Pass, my in, my immediate reaction was, I'm going to return that. And then I ended up not returning it because I was like, well, you know what? I'll support them. And I don't want to have to worry about my save disappearing. So like the thing, like Russ, you brought up something that's kind of interesting to me. And I wonder, I mean, we can go back and forth about it, it, hypotheticals, but here's my question. These games that come to game pass and you try them and you, you bounce, maybe you bounce off them very quickly. Do you feel like if you had paid money for those games outside of a subscription to Game Pass, that you would have stuck with those games longer and would have been engaged longer than you would have otherwise? What do you think about that, Russ? Yeah, totally. So I, I do actually, I look at that every time, like with something on Game Pass, I'll pull it up and also see how much it costs to buy it. Because the thing about Game Pass, unless it's like a Halo game or whatever, I always feel like it's going to disappear at some point. And so I never want to install those games onto my Xbox because I'm like, ah, it's going to be gone. Like maybe I'll just buy it instead. And that way I have it on my dashboard. And the games that are on my dashboard are the ones that I'll actually play. Because when I sit down, I'm like, oh, I want to play something. I will look at like those five, ten games that are right then and there. And those are the ones that are pre-installed, you know. And I don't, I don't want to wait on installation all that stuff too. And so... It is a weird thing where the temporary like feeling of Game Pass means that I only treat that as a trial kind of experience where I'm like, okay, I can try this game for free, basically. And and to be honest, I often will just do the cloud streaming thing because I don't want to do the install. I'll just be like, ah, it's a little bit laggy, but I'll get 10 minutes with it and then I'll decide whether or not I want to play it. The um the most recent Requiem game was one where I was like, I don't think this is a game for me but I want to try it out and I don't want to deal with the installation size. So I'm just going to cloud stream it and see how it is. And I was able to play that for 10 minutes and I was like, yep, I'm right. This is not a game for me. And so that was the kind of experience that I use for game pass, making it more or less likely whether or not I will install it, you know, whether or not I own it and play it is absolutely a thing for me. If I own it and it's in my library and it's in my dashboard, I am so much more likely to actually play it. Yeah. This, this makes me think that like game pass is us paying money monthly to just have demos. Be like, hey, is this something yeah. we actually want to buy or not? <laughs> right. It's I mean, like Gamefly yeah. almost. Yeah, where it's like yeah, you're just paying like a trial period for subscription thing. I get it that people will play their whole stuff on there. And it's pretty awesome when th that does work. You know, I, there was a game I just was trying yesterday. Uh, I forgot what it was, but I, I installed it. I started it up and my save game from like 10 years ago worked. And I was like, this is amazing. You know, it was so cool. And so I like that trial aspect. But yeah, I don't use it as like a permanent access to games and i'm only going to play what's available right now i don't use it like that what about you carrie do you I, you 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 stick mostly to game pass on your xbox right um typically i'll be more on xbox only because of the integration between the x cloud and xbox is a little bit more unified where the x cloud is the xbox version versus the pc version and you know, I have some weird things like old bethesda games having like pc saves but not xbox and cloud saves so i'll tend to want to do the xbox cloud version instead um honestly if the thing game pass is a success to me insofar as i stopped playing on xbox in 2010 i bought an Xbox One in uh, 2013 and then never played on Xbox ever again until Game Pass came back. If Game Pass didn't exist, I wouldn't have an Xbox Series X at all because there would be no reason for me to do it. I've already, like in 2010, I had already made the decision that I was going to be PC gaming from that point forward. Like I was like, if it's multi-platform, I do PC. If there's exclusive, I'll get a console for that. And that was my mindset. And now that everything is more or less coming PC, it's just like, well, I'll just be PC only and I'll have like, you know, the Nintendo things on the side. Mm -hmm. um, but Case yeah, so right. yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the um, uh, I typically will do that. But then there's some some that I do use PC Game Pass, but it's kind of not it's it isn't as good. Right. First off, it's it's a weird front end for Windows Store where it's still downloading on the Windows Store for stuff. And sometimes that breaks and things are weird. And unless you're like plugged in, you're not going to know what the hell's going on. Uh, and then the other part of it is like the making your PC, the like home PC game pass is like hidden away in some setting. So if you go on a flight 
and then there's no internet. It's like you can't play it. You go, you open up the Xbox app, and it's like, where are all the games I installed? And it's like, well, you're not connected to the internet. I have no way to authorize or validate that you are a Game right. Pass uh, person. It's the most frustrating experience ever. So um, I, that's another reason why I just I, <clears throat> on Xbox it's easier, where you can just say, this is my primary Xbox console. And no matter what you install on there, it's just like, okay, you have the license for this to run without internet. Go ahead and start doing all that crap. So um, typically, I I do things like that. Um, I still feel like Xbox is a good – I still love it as a service, and I think it highlights a lot of the problems in the industry. Uh, we, you know, we talk about it. Well, you know, there's a report that was out that most of the people are still playing six-year-old games, 10-year-old games, and right. they just keep on playing the same six- and 10-year-old games. And we're in the spot. You look at Sony games, and it was wise of them to do this. Uh, you look at God of War and God of War Ragnarok. That was just them, like, remake, you know, using the thing that they had and just building more on top of it to sell a new game. Spider-Man 2 is just that. Spider-Man was just more Spider-Man. Uh, so it's just like they're building on things that have these shorter dev cycles because we can't keep on having these eight, seven, eight year dev cycles. Those types of releases just don't work on Game Pass at all. So uh, I think that, you know, you look at it, Pal World is a good example. Adam brought that up. Pal World is an example of like a uh, early access gas game. You just met, you kit bash this thing real quick. You send it out there and see what happens. And they did that a few times. Sea of Thieves basically started off like that. Sea of Thieves was like this nothingness that you would go into and it was like, well, what the hell are we doing? There's a bunch of people that play Sea of Thieves and love Sea of Thieves. And when it first started off, it was like, what do, what do I do? And Grounded started off like that. That doesn't have as big of a, a, a yeah. presence as Sea of Thieves does. But you see a lot of those early access gas games that Game Pass kind of makes it better. You don't have to pay anything. You can just go into it. And I think it highlights, especially with you know a lot of indie games coming to Game Pass, it highlights... Uh, games that don't have these big dev cycles that can have this payoff uh, for playing in that thing. And I, like a double A game is something that I would rather prefer. A game that's six hours long, eight hours long is something that I prefer anyway. Uh, so I always see Game Pass as like that is the best place for those types of games. And if you have these, like Grand Theft Auto 6 would never go on Game Pass because that game's going to make a bazillion dollars from sales. And if they put it on Game Pass, they'd be shooting themselves everywhere in every foot they possibly could just every employee is just like there's no amount of money that you could do to put that on game pass day one right um so yeah there there's um i like game pass i don't particularly think it's a problem for the industry i think it's just highlighting the problems of the industry generally adjacent to it yeah i think that um I, i'm gonna be completely open about this is i was all for microsoft buying Activision Blizzard because I didn't like how Activision Blizzard was being run and I was like maybe the people at Microsoft will put a stop to the shenanigans that are happening over at Activision Blizzard but I think it's actually going the opposite direction like Activision it's like they they got infected and uh, right. they invited somebody who was infected into their house and now it's spreading and just making things worse I, I feel like I can say I was wrong about Microsoft buying Activision being a a, a good idea because yeah, they're I feel taking like our they, toys away. Right, they spent all this money and then they they were like, "Well, we're out of money, guys. I guess we got to start cutting some people. Uh, so let's get rid of them and all." And like the first time, I was like, "Okay, I understand that there's some overlap. You just bought a big company and there's a bunch of people who are doing." job a and you already have people doing job a at this company so i i get that there's some layoffs that have to happen but for them to buy these companies and then just say all right and now we're going to close these studios not even just like sell these studios like you know what if you don't want it turn or turn it around and sell it make some money from it so that these people can still be employed and we can still get these games because you know microsoft said we want more games, more, I can't remember, I think it was Matt Booty said something along the lines of, we want more games that are smaller games, that win awards, that are good. And Tango Gameworks was pitching Hi-Fi Rush 2, and they, they axed them. And then you have 
I don't even understand how this is possible, but Sony and Microsoft are vying for who can be the most hated company right now because they're <laughs> both doing terrible things. This was an awful week. So I think let's let's transition to what Sony did with uh, with with Helldivers two. So we we already talked about this a little bit. You know they 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 brought in this the PSN requirement on PC, made a bunch of people mad because you can't play it in regions where people had already bought it. Perfectly valid reason to be ticked off about. Sony backed off and said, "Okay, all right, sorry, we didn't. You know we didn't mean it. Yes, they did." But, we, you know, we didn't mean it. We, we didn't realize that you guys were going to be so mad about it. Um, we, we're not going to do that. But then they just, they're they are doing the same thing with Ghosts of, uh, Ghosts of Tsushima on, on, or Tsushima. I don't know how to say it. Uh, people get, like, always get mad at me. Um, but how do you say it, Russ? You know how to speak languages. I think it's, I think it's Tsushima. Tsushima. Okay. I'll, I'll get it wrong every time. Um so they're doing the same thing, and then they just delisted Ghost of Tsushima on uh, like 180 countries or something. Now, I don't have a problem with a PSN requirement, but why isn't why isn't your service available worldwide? Your Sony. What, what do you What do you think about that, Russ? It, yeah, I mean, I. It seems like it's a logistical issue, like it's something to do with some sort of policy or whatever. And the thing is that the gamers are the ones who pay for it. And I feel like you know, those who are in those regions have the quietest voice among them. And it's, and it's really unfortunate. Like the lottery of where you were born and where you are living, like determines whether or not you can play a game in the 21st century, which is just ridiculous. So... I feel like it's okay for a game to launch and say a PSN account is required. For them to l launch, not have it required, and then change it after the fact, that's not cool. Ghost of Tsushima doesn't really bother me all that much because they're telling us ahead of time, hey, you, you can't play it. It's It absolutely sucks for the people that are in the countries that are on the screen right now that they're not going to be able to play this game because it's a really good game. Um, somebody had posted on Twitter, I think, that it was delisted in Japan. The game is literally about Japan, and Sony was a Japan game, and then it came back afterwards. So weird. Um, Adam, what do, you, what do you think about that whole situation with the PSN account linking being, uh, you know, pushed on on gamers? Does it bother you at all, or are you just like, well, just I just won't buy those games? No, the, the account linking doesn't bother me. Uh, maybe because I'm on the PC, I'm already used to <laughs> having to link all sorts of accounts and have all sorts of launchers, whatever. Uh, not that it's great, but, you know, it happens. Uh, I feel like this situation, and honestly, kind of the same thing with the Microsoft, is that it really sucks to know that there's so many high-level decisions that that happen that we just don't know. And we'll never know. Somebody made a decision right. somewhere to do something. The devs don't like it, I'm sure. The players don't like it. But these decisions are kind of <laughs> out of some people's hands. Uh, you know, um, on my podcast, The Full Nerd, we have a, a, a frequent contributor, Will Smith. Uh, he's worked in the game games industry a little bit. And one of the things he brought up on our last episode was talking about, like, that these requirements were already actually in place uh, legally. I, I'm, I'm going to butcher it, but it, supposedly, like these these requirements to have this account was already in place legally to 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 have some sort of uh, metrics of of where people were at, uh, and PSN was supposed to roll in to help kind of put that in. And now that PSN has like you know they're like oh we're backed off. Now somebody on that development studio has to go through with making a similar thing to interject into that. So now it's more work on their end. Uh, mm. Yeah, I, <laughs> it's, you know, these large corporations, I, I honestly, like, I feel like it was something that this situation, specifically with Ghost of Tsushima, like, was like, oh, crap, uh, well, we tried this over here. Now we got to do this over here for Ghost of Tsushima before it comes out. But then it's... Mis miscommunication, mismanagement, people scrambling to try to figure stuff out. Luckily, the game isn't out yet. 
and hopefully they are issuing refunds to people who aren't going to be able to get it uh, because it's not out yet. But yeah, I mean, Sony, I'm glad Sony is embracing the PC. Hell yeah. Yes. Because the PC continues to win. But yeah, they've they've got a long way. They've got a long way. I do think that they have a long way to go. And I, I look, the only way that they will do that, they will embrace continue to embrace PC is if they can get those accounts because those accounts give them the ability to market to people. And so oh, I, sure. I get why they want to do this. But don't sell your game in the regions where you can't play the game. Like, somebody has to have just, like, they got to have a list on the wall someplace. I'm sure that they do now. But somebody should have had a list on the wall and said, oh, we can't sell it in this country. We got to make sure that it doesn't go on Steam in that country. It's just really, really strange. Um, uh, Carrie, any thoughts on this? Um, yeah, there's a part of me that <clears throat> instead of using the whip, they should have used the carrot type of yeah. thing. And it's, I don't know, I, I get it, right? Like, it was like, oh, well, now we have to make promotional crap for people to attach their PSN account. For what it's worth, they already did that. They did it for Sackboy. Sackboy is if you created, uh, if you tied your PSN account to the PC game, they gave you some skin for Sackboy. And I was like, oh, okay, so that's like totally leading by a carrot, right? Like, there is a thing that you get for linking your PSN account to the game. And I feel like that's better. <clears throat> and I have to wonder, there's a part of me, right? It says, oh, that requirement was there all the time. But then there's also the part of me that, like, Sony's like, oh, man, Helldivers 2 is doing way better than we thought it was going to happen on PC. <laughs> we got to we gotta start getting all this, all this data. And they're like, you know, push the button. <laughs> and they push the button. And the devs are like, whoa, what's going on? Not that and, button. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so I don't know. It's weird. It's weird to see uh, what's going on. They backed off, and then they're doubling down. And they, they, there's a part of it where there was some tweet that I read that was kind of like kind of a shitty attitude and I don't agree with it, but the guy was like, all oh, these countries that they're not selling to, this is a rounding error to them. And I'm like, uh, all right, I can get that. They're not going to make a bunch of money from whatever, you know, these particular regions, but like that still sucks for all the people that live there. Like, <laughs> like just because it's a rounding error to whoever that's, you know, if their only recourse is piracy okay uh, but i don't know it's just a a really crappy situation all around and yeah it's it's i would say that this playstation situation is not as bad as the microsoft situation though no. microsoft really stepped up microsoft really stepped up and helped sony out here they were like oh man you guys <laughs> yeah are, <laughs> don't worry guys i got you back one second <laughs> <clears throat> the race to the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> We're closing these four studios, guys. We got you, Sony. Well, I, I do wonder though. <laughs> do, do you think the the overall general Sony user even cares about all these problems on the PC? Because this is you know getting into the PC is a new space for Sony. So maybe all the the typical Sony fanboys who are just playing on their console, they they probably don't even care. No, I don't. Uh, I don't think that they care even a little. Um, yeah, right. Well, I, that's not fair. There's some, I would say a majority of them don't care. Actually, no. I would say a majority of them don't even know about this. And I would say a lot of the people that do know about this don't care. And the number of people who know about this and care are few and far between. That's my guess. But it's mostly just because th unless you're plugged into the PC space like, like we happen to be, you're just not going to know about this stuff. Like I was talking to my wife and she made some reference and I go, what are you talking about? I don't get that reference. And she goes, you and I have different internets. And I was like, yeah, you're right about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. <clears throat> when you get down to it, it's, uh, I'm, Sony is in a position where they could totally eventually make it so that PlayStation is supported in those countries. We're probably never going to get the studios that Microsoft ever cl closed back. So um, yeah. PlayStation could recover from this, whereas Microsoft can't. They, they in fact, won't. So that's really the situation where it is in turn so far as, yeah, they both have really bad PR right now. One is far worse than the other, but it still is just a general drag uh, all around. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Um, all right. Enough negativity. Because it was, it was like, 
I was talking to uh, Rich yesterday. Uh, we were on the phone, and I was like, "I'm I, all week long. I have just been mad about the Xbox situation. Like all week long, it was just ticking me off. And every time I opened up Twitter or whatever, it was shown to me and again, and I would just made me even madder. And I was like, "Okay, I I need to I need to get away from the negativity. So let's dive into some positivity because, like I said at the top of the show." We live in two universes at once. The gaming industry feels like a multiverse. Uh, one universe where everything is on fire and, you know, it's like that that meme from Community where Troy walks in carrying the pizza and, the you know, they're, they're like, it's the craziest thing happening and it's awful. But then we also live in this world of indie games and indie games had a moment this week. So let's move in and talk about the games that we've been playing. Um, but first, before we talk about the games that we've been playing, uh, I have to I have to say that we've got a new segment on the show called the Nerd Test. I, I tried that episode or uh, the segment last week, and I said, "What do you guys think we should call it?" And Opo Sai, hopefully I said that right. They said we should call it the Nerd Test, which is perfect because you know, nerd nest and it rhymes and all that stuff. So that's what we're going to call it. Thank you very much for the suggestion, Opo Sai. Uh, for those of you that don't know how it works, basically uh, the way that the, the the nerd test works is I'm going to, I'm going to play a sound from a video game and the panel, like it's, it's basically the panel versus Bill. So they want to figure out the name of the game. They get 10 questions. They can ask me 10 questions. They're yes or no questions. And they get three guesses to figure out what game that is. All right. So are you guys ready? Yeah. All Let's right. Do Here we I'm go. I'm so Let's, bad at this. No, no. It, it's, it, but it's a team effort. There's three of you. You guys, yeah. <laughs> you guys can beat me on this. I believe three in you. Three versus Here, one. That's right. Here we go. Are you serious? We have a picture. I'm Commander Sims of the Sega Control Attack Team. Scat Mission 230. Five teenage girls have disappeared after spending the night at the old Lakeshore Winery House of Mr. and Mrs. Victor Martin and their children, Jeff and Sarah. All right, so I, I, I can give you more later, but first off, do you guys have any questions for me? <laughs> Is it a, it's I mean, a I can tell CD you game. it's a Sega CD game because of the boot up sound. Right. Yes, it's, it is a Sega uh, that, CD game. That logo afterwards is like the same studio that made Sewer Shark, because I remember that sound because I had Sewer Shark as like a pack in game for the Sega CD. I forgot what it's called, digital something or other. And then, yeah, it's one of those FMV like. So either like Night Trap or sewer, it's not Sewer Shark, but you know Night I, Trap I or something Night like Trap, that. Yeah. I, yeah. It's, I think it's Night Trap just because it's five teens, uh, but that's what that's what I'm leaning towards. But yeah, it's definitely an FMV. Game. Yeah, I say never learn more. Play that game, so. Mission two three zero and Sarah. Right now, another five girls are headed towards the Martins to spend the night. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they figured it we out. Zero of the ten questions, and we just go all in on <laughs> right. On the okay. First guess. Yeah. And what is it? Night, Night trap. trap. Yeah. Night trap. Night trap. See. Okay. I got to make these <laughs> <Nice>. way harder. <laughs> <laughs> I thought because you great. were, I figured first off, Adam's a PC guy, so I would have made it hard because you know, old console stuff. I, I started as a console gamer. I'm, oh, I came you did. Too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that was Night Trap by Digital Pictures was the, the the developer that you were trying to think of. And yes, it was on the Sega CD from 1992. One of the games responsible for the ESRB, which I always thought that that was uh, uh, fun. Yeah, I, I played it recently when they did the re-release on uh, a couple years ago, I guess. And yeah. I was like, yeah, and I was just like, oh man, this is like... This is nothing. I'm sure at the time it was just like, oh, oh God, clutch your pearls. <laughs> so I was right. like, this is that weird. I mean, right. it was weird, well, but not like that weird. So originally, because I ended up watching a documentary about it uh, a few years back, and originally 
like they they didn't have those weird dudes in trash bags or whatever. They had vampires, and the vampires would bite the girls or whatever. And then they they said that's too intense or too scary. So they ended up having those guys in the trash bags, and then they had like a a weird mechanical claw that would hook around their necks and drill into their necks. You never saw that happen. But they would have that, and I was like, that's way more horrifying yeah, that's way than more what they scary. originally had planned. <laughs> yeah, this is like, you know, I was, you know, 12, 13 when that game came out. And same thing with Mortal Kombat, you know, was going on to the home consoles at that same time. And yeah, my mom, like she saw the news and she she saw those games. We were banned from being able to play uh, Night Trap at all. And then I had to just, I had to work it in order to get Mortal Kombat. And I was like, look, there's no blood in, because they didn't know about the blood code, you know, because there was a code you had to put in. <laughs> and so I was like, look, there's no blood. There's no fatalities. It's just like Street Fighter, you know? And uh, yeah, she let me get it. And uh, as soon as I got it, I put in that blood code. is awesome. My, oh, my, mom rest, was, my mom was the complete opposite. When I was like eight years old, she bought me Leisure Salary 1 because I wanted it. And I was just like, oh, <laughs> I still have my uh, five and a quarter floppy uh, from, from when she went to eat. Hey, hey, listen. <laughs> we all need to know that information, Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you remember on Leisure Suit Larry when you had to, like, the, it had like a quiz to see if yeah, you were yeah. old enough? It was like, who was the president well, in yeah. whatever year? And you would be like, Mom, it, who was no. president in 19, whatever? And then I you just, could type it I, in. I just kept on answering it, uh, and eventually I memorized all the answers. Uh, but yeah, it was always a pain in the ass whenever they had like, <laughs> price. And I put it in, and be like, "You're a kid," and you know, boot me out. I'm like, start right. it back up again. This, there's no, there's nothing that's like deleting this game or anything. It just boots you yeah. out real. Quick. It's not like it's that big of a deal. Uh, so no, eventually I just, uh, yeah, just pass through those. All right. Well, you guys beat me, so that's uh, panel two, bill zero, and you get this sound. Uh, let's, uh, let's move on and talk about the games that we've been playing today. And, uh, before we do though, Adam, you said that you've been working on building keyboards. Yeah. You know, in my realm, uh, benchmarking and building are games in themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm mostly building PCs, but then there's that contingent of people over there who build a lot of keyboards and I've been looking at it from a distance and hemming and hawing and being like, mm, do I want to try this? Do I want to try this? And inching ever so close uh, to, to that group. Uh, and yeah, so I, I, I built, I bought some keycaps. Then recently I bought some, uh, some PCBs and some switches, even got some nice. lube and all that kind of stuff. We're actually going to do my whoa, first. Whoa, whoa, that, goes, my... that goes really well with uh, <laughs> Carrie's five and a quarter five floppy. A quarter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got to lube up that uh, five and a quarter. <laughs> no, <don't> do that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, this is all leading to me doing uh, our, my first uh, custom keyboard build on a live stream on PC World. Uh, go subscribe over there. Tune in. It'll it'll be fun. I'll, I'll probably ruin something. Uh, I'm excited for it. But yeah, I guess I was wondering: Are any of you guys into to cu building custom keyboards? Uh, any any advice you can give me? Um, <clears throat> you know, so uh, when when we were at LTX, there was a, a booth that had this like L shape. I actually recorded everything there because I had my, my wife was going, I was like, Oh, record this with me. So I went through every key and I was just like, mm. okay, that one's nice. And I was going oh. through and I tried every key and I have the video somewhere. I have to go out. I think it's like a key cron white or something. Um, mm. that is my favorite key. So I have to recheck the video, the next keyboard that I buy, I'm going to definitely go and get the keys that I like, but it was a, a fantastic, I feel like Micro Center and Best Buy should totally have a section there so you can just like like feel a full set of keys with the different uh, switches. Uh, mm -hmm. Just having that at LTX, that was such a, a, a great experience. Luckily for me, I was there before, you know, it, the place was flooded with people. It was where we had their pre-access. But that was the only thing I think, um, you know, they sell sample keys that you can kind of press. It's not as good as having like a full keyboard where you can press every key. And you're only like pressing one key. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, outside of that, no, I think like everything that you already talked about is par for the course. You just kind of go through it and that's it. It's just like, you know, it's 
standard fare. But yeah, there are people that are super hardcore. My last job, there was a dude that had a briefcase of keyboards that had like foam inserts and he had like five keyboards in this briefcase. And I was like, oh, that's a pretty sweet keyboard. He's like, hold on. <laughs> like, <laughs> he opens up his briefcase. Oh. I was like, what's in there? And he's like, doom. I was like, nice. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I, I know people who have like keyboards, like just – you know, dozens of keyboards like hanging on their wall and stuff. And then they're like, well, how many PCs do you have built at the office? And I'm like, all right, well, touche, touche. Yeah. I've got a lot of PCs that I'm not using. <laughs> yeah. My keyboard, uh, like, like I know a good keyboard when I feel it, but I'm not at the point where I'm saying this is like my specific, like, you know, this is the force actuation that I prefer or whatever. Like I'm not there yet, mm -hmm. but I just know when I like one and I like being in that space because getting to that other space is very expensive and I don't want to do that. Yeah. And so yeah. I've got a good yeah. half dozen keyboards of various types. Some are like review things and whatnot, but, um, yeah, I, 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 I can feel the pull like you, Adam, where I'm like, I see it from a distance and I'm like, this could be a rabbit hole for me. And I just kind of prevent myself from doing it. So it's like 3d printing. Like I don't want to touch it. So a few years ago, maybe two years ago, I think, I had a Logitech wireless keyboard. I huge. I was a huge fan of that keyboard. And the reason I was a huge fan of it was because it had, um, it was wireless because I have zero interest in wires on my desk. If I can avoid a wire, I will avoid a wire. Um, it was wireless. It could connect to three things at the same time. So I would just hit a button and switch to, to a different uh, input, uh, which was really, really handy, uh, especially because, you know, I have a I have a PC and then I have a Mac. And then, you know, then I had the Steam Deck and I needed to be able to, you know, I didn't want to have to do touchscreen stuff on the Steam Deck if I was going into desktop mode for anything. So it was great. And then one day I decided, you know what, I think I need to clean it. And I broke it. I took all the keys apart, and then when I pulled the when I pulled the space bar off, I ended up breaking it. I was so mad. So I did a bunch of research, and I I haven't built one, but I ended up buying this, which is a Keychron um, K4 Pro. And the thing, it I had a few requirements that I needed to have on this keyboard. It needed to be wireless. It needed to be able to connect to multiple things at the same time. Those, those were the things that I really, really wanted. And I also wanted it to be backlit so that if I, because it's usually pretty dark in here, and I wanted to be able to look down and see the buttons if I needed to. Um, love this thing. You know what I love most about this? I think that there's like a steel plate in the bottom of it. This thing is like right. five pounds. Mm -hmm. And it is like you put it down on your desk and it does not move. And I absolutely love that. And honestly, I think that's more important than whatever switches you get but what switches are you going with adam uh so yeah i, I got one of those testers that had like what 70 something switches on them oh uh gosh. and was going around but i i love i love clicky uh so mm -hmm. I, I i don't have it here it's at the actually actually at the office i got three three bags at a, a local shop down in san jose called tiny keyboard uh, shop really cute place uh and finally got some switches there so god i always mess up the name of this company k-a-l-i-h i want to say kali but it's not kali it's kale oh what are they? i think yeah i, I think, think it's kale, kale. This is kale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah so box navy box jade but super super clicky i love them one of them has a different actuation point. I, I, I don't fully know how to describe it, but, uh, and then when I was there, they also had, uh, I'm going to butcher this name too, Gateron, Gateron. Gateron. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they had, what was it? Melodic clicky. I think it was the mm. name of it. Real, real interesting click to it. Uh, I've been using, uh, I think these, so I have that, uh, I'm just going to unplug it and it's going to mess everything up. Uh, I've been using this, uh, eight bit do, cool. Oh uh, yeah, the, the retro keyboard. I love this thing. This has got the the kale box whites, uh, mm -hmm. nice and clicky, but not not clicky enough. I need more click. I love yeah. listening you know, to 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 keyboard people talking about keyboards. It's like listening to somebody who's like a wine connoisseur, and they're like, <laughs> "Oh yeah, you can you smell it first, and then you take your sip and you swish it around, you spit it or whatever, all that stuff." And I'm like, "Wine's gross. What is wrong with you people?" But. <laughs> but <laughs> but like they're always like talking about how how great the, the the this kind of thing is and it actuates at this point and I'm just like 
I can type words. What were you going <laughs> to say, Russ? I was going to say, you know, I, uh, so I use a new fee keyboard. It's like in all my videos and whatnot, you know, this thing. And this one comes with uh, linear switches, so they're not clicky. But I like clicky ones too, especially after I got the 8 bit Doe one. I was like, oh, this is good. So I bought a bunch of blue switches for this keyboard. And it takes time to like pull these out and put in the new switch and stuff. So it's like a half hour of work, basically. So I put on some music and I did that. I put them all in, put all the caps back in, started typing. And I was like, I hate this. Like, I don't know what it is with this keyboard or with these switches, but this is a terrible combination. So another half hour of me taking all them off and then putting huh. the original in ears back in. And so and I wasted $40 getting all those switches. And so I'm very interested. I'm going to watch your video and see how you, how you like it, because I found that um, the theory all made sense. And then the actual use of it, I was like, this is terrible. When's the live stream, Adam? Uh, at this point, it's probably going to be have to be after Computex. So uh, ne next month, I think. Okay. Yeah, I've been slow, once again, I've been slowly gathering the different uh, parts. And yeah, we're, we're just going to build a bunch of them like back to back just to kind of see. Nice. So. So yeah, I got a question for Russ and Adam. You guys both have uh, the 8-bit dough keyboard. Mm -hmm. Do you ever use those big red and blue but or the, the, the giant <laughs> B and A buttons on the left-hand side that it comes with? Because it's cool, but why? <laughs> my my yes, uh, my my wife, uh, like when, when I unboxed it, I was like, check this out. And she immediately took those and she was like, oh, these are awesome. I'm going to take them. So I don't even get, I don't even get to <laughs> what, experience them. What does she use them for? Just, just clicking just just, <laughs> just like a, like a fidget spinner kind of thing yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay yeah. <laughs> so i do not uh so actually i i got so many keyboards so this one now is at the house and it's the one that my son uses for homework i don't like uh full profile i like low profile keyboards so uh mm. for typing in my own like use like it's not a good fit and so i was like hey this, this is like a cool setup here and he loves it um I was using it previously when I was doing all my testing. I was using those big buttons for save state and load state when I was playing games. So I would like when I'm trying to play, for example, Tecmo Super Bowl, like I like to save a state right before a move or right before a play. And then if it doesn't play out the way I want, then I load the state and I try it again. Because <laughs> I'm trying to get a perfect game. Like I like to do 99 versus zero against the computer. It's like just one of those ways that I relax while playing retro games. And so that's what I was that's using cool. it for. It's just like save state, load state, you know. But I'll tell you, having them right next to each other, there were many times where I meant to hit load state and I would hit save state. And that means that I'm like, ah, oh, I just lost my play, you know? Whoops. And so, yeah, so uh, I don't use it in that, in that way, but my son loves that keyboard. So. <laughs> Very cool. Um, all right, let's talk about what we've been playing. We've got these indie, indie darlings, and I can see like three of us have played Animal Well. And I want to say before we talk about it, I don't want to spoil any mechanics in the game at all because it's so weird. It's so weird. This game is 40 megabytes. It is gorgeous. I don't know what the hell they're doing with the lighting, but it just looks beautiful all the time. And I've never seen a world that is more interactive than Animal Well. Like there's vines hanging from the ceiling and everything, everything that you bump into has collision detection and moves around. Carrie, talk about Animal Well a little bit. Um, yeah, so quickly, this is not much of a spoiler because I don't think it, I don't think it affects the game. But you know those those vines that you're talking about. Yeah. If you did, you see the the Twitter thing of it. I wish I'd have grabbed that for the show. Yeah, go ahead, tell them about it because it's crazy. So someone put it in. So someone put the game in windowed mode, and if you just click and drag the window around, the vines move based on the window that you're moving around. Wow. <laughs> so the game no is shit. aware. Yeah, the game is aware of like you moving around the window of the game and the things will just breeze around. Like that's the degree of like how hardcore this game is. <laughs> like you see Adam's face right now. That, okay, that you, you just hard, you just told me. <laughs> that's how good Animal Well is. Animal Well is this nonstop. It's all right. Uh, this goes into there's a bit of a thing here that I want to unpack a bit. Animal Well is everything I love about video games. I hate tutorials. It's one of the reasons why I love Breath of the Wild so much. They just kind of just like throw you out there. There's maybe like three tool tips and it's like, you know, whatever, press these buttons. But then they kind of just threw, out, threw you out there and left you to your own devices to figure out how anything works. And Animal Well is the same way. There's no tutorial. It's just you go and you do things. And <clears throat> at some moments of the game, the game is just totally surreal. And then at other moments, uh, it is the most high anxiety, high stakes part. Like you just out of nowhere, 
something will just like come and you're like, oh no, what do I do? And there's other parts where you're like, oh, okay, where I am is safe right now. But then, oh no, you're not safe. Um, and there's parts of these where my heart rate goes to like 170 beats a second. And <clears throat> there's parts of those games that are really cool. But the best part of Animal Well is that they they pivot the notion of what Metroidvanias are. Everyone anticipates with the, you know, like you get a double jump in Metroidvanias. You do get a double jump in Animal Well. It's just in a different way. Mm-hmm. Not only that, there are more things to it on top of that. So everything is like that. Everything and how Bill was saying how everything is super interactive. You sh- you let your curiosity be your guide because there's so many times when you're you're at a place and you're like, oh, this is a Metroidvania. I just don't have the item yet to do that. And you really need to think about everything you have and everything you could possibly do with that to get do what to to accomplish to get past whatever environment you're in and typically you will be satisfied by your own curiosity and there's so many times that that happens i had no joke 10 epiphanies back to back to back within like three hours on my plane back from chicago last uh last week and i was just like loving this game more and more and more and there's parts of the thing um you you get Oh man, I want to talk about the stuff that you can get. You, you, you well, get a, uh, things that are in the trailer, I think, are safe, Carrie. Yeah, but I want to talk about a thing that is not in the trailer. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. You, 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 you see that bubble wand? There's a, a thing that you get, um, and uh, pay attention to the surroundings. Pay attention to the surroundings because they are communicating to you. Everything communicates to you, and. Um, also you think that there's a set number of items, but it, it gets more and more. And that dog is frightening. Um, yes. so that comes up a mul- multiple times. Those ghosts are frightening. There's lots of things where you will like, you'll go under that part. I don't know if you've gotten to that part, but yeah, so you can actually see him, right? You saw the, the ostrich's neck come and follow you down in the place that you think that you're safe. So yeah. you go like uh, underground and you're like, oh good, I'm safe. And then all of a sudden the ostrich's neck starts going down and starts following you. And you're like, oh no, I gotta get out of here. And you're trying to like, just like hug up against the wall and it's like perfectly done. It's, there's so many times where the game is almost absolutely perfectly done because every spot that I was at was seemingly perfect to not get hit. And I don't know if there's just, it was programmed in such a way that there was just always like one square away from you. So you always just felt like in the nick of time that you saved yourself, but it was just all of these moments that came and coalesced into just a really fantastic game that you need to play. And what I, t- I said in our chat and what, um, uh, Rich like was like say less was it's a Metroidvania meets out uh, the Outer Wilds, um, and that is probably the best thing because the Outer Wilds is a thing that you kind of learn as you play, and that is just what Animal Well is as well. It's, it's such a fantastic, fantastic game. It deserves all of the reviews that it's getting, and um, it, it's not that long of a game. Um, so I I rolled credits and I think like seven hours, but there's still more to it afterwards. Um, it's everything I love about video games. Yeah. I'm cool. five, I'm five hours into it right now on my steam deck. <laughs> um, it's, it's unbelievably good. And the one thing that I want to say before I jump to Russ, uh, because he's played it too, is this week, everybody has been talking about, you know, how important it is to support developers and stuff like that. And then this game comes out and everybody says, Look at what an amazing game that Donkey made. And I'm like, well, Donkey's the publisher. He didn't make it. It was made by Billy Basso. Nothing against Donkey. He uh, clearly did a great job publishing this game because it's a masterpiece. Um, but I just want to make sure everybody, you know, support, you know, support that dev because he did an amazing job. Russ, what did you think of Animal Well? I haven't had a lot of time with it, um, mostly because I was working on my Legion Go video. Uh, and so I just, and I've been doing all sorts of studio tomfoolery. I got a new angle, as you can tell here. Uh, so lots of work here at the studio. Um, but I played maybe a half hour, and I love it. The thing about it, and, and it's it's so hard to explain, but the moment I turned it on and started playing it, I was like, okay, this is a game for me because it feels correct. Like just the like the jumping mechanics, the physics of it, all of it is very uh, Celeste-like for me. 
like precise and it just, it feels good. And so, um, that was, I was immediately sold on it. It's like 25 bucks. And I was like, okay, I just, I made all that money back because that, that amount of enjoyment, the feel of this game is so hard to replicate and get right, especially in like indie Metroidvanias. I don't like it when they're too floaty or, you know, just too smooth or whatever. This is perfectly precise for me. So really enjoying that aspect of it. Uh, and yeah, I'm looking forward to unlocking it. I got a long flight to New York from Hawaii coming up in about a week and a half. So that's my plan is to kind of play through it then. Very cool. Have You haven't had a chance to play it yet, Adam? Uh, I've been playing a better animal game, which we can talk about in a minute, but, uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, no, I heard about, I heard you talking about it last week, uh, on, on your last episode, you're, you're hinting about it not, and, and you said the magical word for me, Metroidvania. And I was like, okay, let me go hit the buy button. And then I watched the trailer and I was like, I was like, oh no, actually, I, I don't, I don't know if I'm smart enough or good at games enough to do this. <laughs> so that's my question. Like, like, it sounds like you need to be pretty smart. To figure out some of these puzzles because i'm i'm not the smartest guy i wouldn't well i don't tell yourself short but uh what <laughs> here's what i would say hour one with the game i was very confused and i was like what in the hell am i supposed to do yeah after uh, as as you spend time in this world you like like carrie was saying you have these epiphanies you're like okay i understand that now oh that's how that works i didn't understand i i misunderstood that and it's almost like the game maybe not maybe it's accidental but it's almost like the game is designed in a way to give you those moments when you need them yeah and that is something that doesn't happen very often would you agree with that carrie yeah, uh, so, so I'm, I didn't explain it very eloquently, but there's uh, there's everything about the game, whether it is you trying to navigate what seems impossible to navigate, even though you have the tools to do it, and you just need to just go, oh, okay, l let me think about that. Uh, all right, what if I, oh, ho, 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 ho. It, that's basically like what I can say without being like spoilerific, but even facing enemies feels like, there is a bounding box of uh, almost making you feel like a genius. It, they, they, it's like, oh, you just did the right thing at the right time. And that's what I felt like, oh, I was doing the right thing. But I almost question if I was doing the right, th right thing at the right time versus uh, Billy Basso be like, oh, this person's probably going to have difficulty here. So let me just kind of to like cycle around this. And it, it makes you feel like a genius everywhere you're going. And um, it, it's uh, it's great. It's such a great game. Well, but is it more like about figuring out and then having to execute on it? Kind of like Celeste. Like, I feel like the execution part of it, I was right. never good at. So but is the, it more about figuring it out and then the execution isn't like, there, like there, trivial? You get that. You get that bubble wand within like an hour and they show that off in the trailer. Yeah, <clears throat> that bubble wand is effectively your double jump the i don't want to spoil it but like you just have to like reason your way through it because there's other times that there's lots of bubbles so in terms of platforming yeah you have to be kind of specific to mm -hmm. russ's credit it is very very uh it's it's precise so nailing your jumps and stuff isn't mm -hmm. terribly difficult because the game is done well if that makes any sense but there's like you know like there's no like pixel perfectness around like landing on a bubble just perfectly you have like some you can see him like kind of like having a good amount yeah. of leeway like he's definitely off of it so there's lots of places to do that but you look at those bubbles and stuff and that's probably the hardest type of platforming that exists in the game outside of that no there's nothing that is terribly difficult there's one part where you have to get to a secret that i did in like five minutes and i felt like a superhuman and it <laughs> is it is a um it was an advanced mechanic because there's like two parts that were getting locked and you had to like use an item and then do a thing and then do another thing and mm -hmm. i did them all in succession and i was like no way did i just do all of that within five minutes because that shouldn't have happened the only thing was was when i i landed there um I had all the tools at my disposal to get myself out of there only because I knew how to get out of there. And 
I, oh God, I wish I could spoil so many things because I was like, <laughs> I figured that part out and I figured that part out. And I was it's just like, oh. yeah. So uh, basically when you land on a platform and you go into water, you got your character can't swim. So it's like, boop, you don't die. And technically you don't even lose health. You'll just reappear back on the platform that you landed on. So yeah, the problem that. that's, yeah. So the problem that sucked for me was I went through this crazy, you know, the parkour thing and landed on a platform to get somewhere but then i was locked out and couldn't get out of there but i knew how to get out of there so i was like oh i'll just have to die to get over here so i died and i went back to the platform i was just inside the locked corner i was like oh no <laughs> and, then I was like, and then i was like oh wait no i know how to get out of this and um uh yeah so i did get out of it the only thing is again the game doesn't tell you anything so you if you're not paying attention and you're not it doesn't take a genius it really doesn't just look just look and go, why? Just ask why. Why things are doing the things that they're doing. And like, look at the things that you got and you're like, oh, <laughs> I get this now. Yeah. It's so good. Um, and the map yeah. is incredibly dense. Incredibly yeah. dense. Like everything is packed. Like there is not a corner of this map that I've seen so far that I felt like that's kind of empty. It's It's everything is packed with... Oh, there's a little path right here, and there's another little path right here, and and the the thing that I found that myself doing, and maybe that's why I'm five hours in and probably not anywhere close to beating it. Anytime I run into an issue, I say, you know what, I'm just going to go someplace else, and I I go off to another location and I start exploring there, and then I run into an issue. And but while I was in that other area, I've learned something, and then I can go back to the area that I was before. And I, I slowly figure things out that way. It's it's a fantastic game, uh, but I, I'm I'm here to tell you, buy it. You won't regret it. It's really really good. It's absolutely going to be. Uh, I think it could be a game of the year contender this year. Oh, it's yeah. so good. Yeah, that's unfortunate because indie games are typically never included in that segment. Yeah. Uh, but oh man, it's so good, so good. All right, what was the other animal game that, uh, uh, better animal game that you were talking about, Adam? Uh, I have been mainlining Little Kitty Big City. Uh, oh. And I, I am a cat guy through and through, and I <laughs> love that game. Holy crap. That was, it's just, yeah. It's just, for me, mwah, love it. Chef's kiss. I, I, I heard that was good. That's also on Game Pass. Is it? Okay. I, I, can, I'll, can I'll you... buy it 20 times. I don't care. I, nice. <laughs> I love that game. So I tell me about it, it cuz I haven't I haven't touched this. I haven't I, I saw it in a Nintendo Direct and I didn't really pay attention to it even though I love cats. So, I I I loved Stray. Stray was a cool game. You know, you were playing a cat but it was also like this post post-apocalyptic world kind of thing. So this yeah. is literally just like slice of life cat. Like you go around you collect you collect shiny objects you you know you go on fetch quests uh but then yeah you have a button to to meow or yeah you can trip people <laughs> like yeah <laughs> i i don't know i like i just i love being in that world and it's it's surprisingly dense like if i i, I think i main hmm, i think i got the main story done in like five hours but i'm gonna go in and like complete everything because i just love being in that that world and it's it's surprisingly dense, especially for like such a small little game, but it's just packed with charm. It just constantly put a smile on my face. Yeah, and it, it never gets old. Just like the the two uh, the two trigger buttons are your paws left and right to knock things off. So I'm just like <laughs> constantly just going around and just pawing things. I feel uh, this like makes I me like... think of Untitled Goose Game. Yeah, I was saying to say the same thing. Way way better, way better. I yeah. Wow. <laughs> I feel yeah. like. Uh... That's like the one of the defining characteristics of if you're a, a cat person or not. I don't, me and cats don't get along. And one of the reasons that I don't like cats is just because I just think they're big a-holes. Like whenever I just see a cat sitting there and just looking down at an object and it's just like, you know, <laughs> all, off the table it goes. I saw the cat <laughs> making, making those little cat movements. And uh, yeah, it's just like pure a-holery that cats do. Um, <laughs> That See, I, could... I always think of you tr uh, as kind of trolly, Carrie. <laughs> yeah, typically, yeah. <laughs> so you would think that that would be like right up your alley. 
No, yeah, no, no, I, he, I, it's competition. He, yeah, oh, he's like, yeah. this is too much <laughs> like me. Uh, I, so it's it's so look. It, there was a comedian that that said this because when I troll, I come from a place of love, and cats do it from a place of just pure a holery. The the that's the difference between like the difference between cats and dogs. When you give a dog uh, food and water, it looks up and it goes, "You gave me food and water. You must be God." And we do that to a cat, and it goes, "You gave me food and water. I must be God." And that's the difference right. between cats and dogs. <laughs> I think it's just game recognizes game and, and, you know, Carrie's recognizing that they're also <laughs> trolls. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Uh, okay. That's on my list. And uh, I haven't canceled game pass yet. So if it's on game pass, then I will check it out. Uh, absolutely. Um, the other massive game that came out this week in early access is Hades two, which I it's in early access I've heard nothing but like, holy cow, early access, my eye, it's huge. And like, you could just keep playing for 30 hours mm -hmm. or whatever. I don't know. I, I bought it. I played it for a couple of hours and then I played Animal Well and I haven't touched it since. But as soon as I finish Animal Well, I am going right back to Hades 2. Um, Russ, like two weeks ago, you said, I just finished Hades 1 and here's yeah. Hades 2. How are you feeling about it, man? Uh, I'm torn. So I've put five hours, maybe six hours into it so far. So I put a lot of time into it and I decided to stop. And so that's because I want to play the finished game. Like I've, I've got enough of a feel of it. I realize now that it is very similar to the original Hades, just with more stuff, more abilities, more different ways that you can kind of craft things yourself. It feels great. It feels, yeah, like like people are saying, like it feels more uh, complete. But I'm reading all the development notes, and they're talking about all the tweaks that they're going to be doing and stuff like that. And I, I, part of me wants to be part of that community and just like double down and just have a Hades two year, basically, where I'm like one of those guys giving the feedback and testing and doing that stuff. Another part of me wants to just enjoy the finished product, you know, and just kind of enjoy it at the retail release. And so I, yeah, I, I just made a decision. I got pretty far. I got probably, I don't know how the game is going to be structured in terms of length and stuff, but I probably got a fair amount into it where I, you know, got to another area, basically. I don't want to give any spoilers or whatever, but I got pretty far and I was like, okay, um, I, I think this stuff's going to change. And so I'm just going to stop and I'll just play it retail. And even when it comes out retail, I will just start over new game. I don't even want to play through the stuff I've already played. Like I don't. They they've said that your transfers, your your safe games are going to transfer over. I'm like, no, I don't even want it. I'll just start over again. And so, I'm loving it, but uh, I've decided that it's just too much for me. So it is more of the same, and that sounds like a, a bad thing, but it's not a bad thing because the first one was fantastic. The things that make it different are that now you have, I don't know what they call it, but essentially mana to power your abilities and every button has two functions now. So there's the tap function yep. and then there's the hold function. So if you tap and hold, you will basically have a more powerful ability that you are able to cast, um, you know, d via the different things that you level up or whatever. Uh, but you have these different abilities that you're able to cast that do more damage, but they are restrictive because you will run out of mana. Um, which I really like the the new mechanics, but I can also see why somebody might say, okay, um, this game is awesome. I'm just going to wait until it's done. Carrie, have you played Hades 2? I can't see it because I, the show notes are covered up by this video. Uh, no, I'm, I'm in Russ. Uh, when I saw Early Access, I was like, I, I can wait on it. There's too much stuff. I, uh, I'm a big fan of Super Giant Games. When they made Bastion, I was already a big fan of them. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, kudos to them, right? Because they just like, here's Hades 2 early access. And I think they like sold like a million units with like no marketing and no nothing. They just show up on Steam and it's just like gangbusters for them, which is great. I'm super happy for that team that they could just have such this this huge cache of like trust from the the community where they're like, yeah, so yeah, I'm just going to buy it. And uh, I'm going to wait for the, the, the full release of it. Um, I never finished Hades one. I played a few runs of Hades and seeing how far I can get and stuff. And I was always treating like Hades, like, um, like just a typical roguelike, right? Like I'll just see how far I can go, but it never really, 
even when you get back to your 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 base sort of so to speak and see how much you can build up there from whatever which is what i typically like of like what rogue roguelikes do uh rogue legacy was kind of like that but i didn't even like that as much I, there's there's for me there's a i need a bigger allowance uh like vampire survivors vampire survivors you can start investing in other stuff and get bigger and better stuff and then get other characters uh vampire survivors had a a, a much faster pace in terms of right pro- progression and i felt like hades was really like almost like guess uh, games as a service slow of like hey you you got a little something why don't you go spend that nickel somewhere sunny <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh i just felt like i wasn't getting enough and I was like, well, maybe if I play, I'll be able to get more resources to like build faster. And it's like a slow trickle that'll just like be a snowball effect. But I never got to that point where I could really felt like I was really catching a, a lot of, um, you know, getting everything done. And it was just like, you know, I'm, I'm playing through the same things over and over again. So I was like, ah, let me back. I haven't really played Hades that much just because of the progression of it. When I saw Hades 2, uh, I'm interested in it just because I feel like there's things that they could have done in Hades. So I, I still haven't looked at it. I'm hoping to go into it blind. I'm hoping that they add some things uh, that would have appealed to me. Uh, so we'll see where that's going to go, but I'll probably look at it after they have like an actual full release and see where they are. One thing I yeah. will say about it is the music is unbelievably good. Nice. Like, just even the intro music sounds fantastic, but when you are in a fight and you can like hear the guitar, like in the back, you're like there's a bass guitar going in the background and you're fighting and you're like, man, this is really good music. It And there's Dude, a the soundtrack, available soundtrack as well. It's like classic. <laughs> what was that, Adam? Yeah. I couldn't hear you. The, the, the Bastion soundtrack was like classic. Oh yeah. 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 Yep. <laughs> yeah. That was such a good game. I, I played on the iPad back in the day, you know, and it was it was so fun. And the narrator and stuff, you know, like that yeah. was probably the first, maybe the only iPad game that I've actually played all the way through. I well, I played Bastion in pack, one of the first PAX Easts, I think, before they were like out. And I remember putting on the headphones and like you, you, the immediacy of the narrator having such a big impact of like you would like fall off and the narrator was like in the middle of talking something then you fall off and he's like, well, maybe he didn't live that long. And it was whatever <laughs> he said. And I was like, oh, so God, cool. that was awesome. I love how so that, cool. that, yeah, that within the first like 30 seconds, Bastion sold me on it. Like the game looked amazing, right? Uh, but then how far they they kind of really tweaked it was um, the next step for me. I typically like their isometric uh, stuff. Pyre was a weird game. I don't know if that. I remember. I remember seeing Pyre at PAX East, and I was talking to. Oh, he was a he was a game journalist before he joined joined them. His name is escaping me. I was talking to him. I was like, "Is this like a like um, a, a MOBA?" And he was like, "Well, it's kind of its own thing. It's kind of like." And he, he would not just say it was like a MOBA. He was like kind of saying that it was this whatever mix of genres. And I'm looking at it. And I'm like, that just looks like a really small MOBA. <laughs> and like. <Yeah. laughs> And I, I just never felt pyre. But uh, yeah, Hades was always a game that, it, you know, it clicks all the buttons. And when you get further and further along, you're like, man, I'm really, I'm on a hot streak right now. And it's just some weirdo thing that would kill you. And I'm like, ah, of course it had to end yeah. my run in such a silly way. Um, so yeah, there's there's parts of me that, that really like it. But I'm just a huge Supergiant fan in general, indie fan, uh, like indie game yeah. fan in general, yeah. This is a huge week. So, Adam, if you were going to pick one of those two games, Animal Well or Hades, which one do you think that you would probably add to your wish list first? Oh, God. I know I'm a jerk asking that, questions like this. That is, that is hard because I, too, I, I didn't super click with Hades, the original one. I, I mean, I, I liked it. It was a good game. But, yeah, the, the run-based stuff just wasn't wasn't working for me uh, in the way that I like to game, I guess. I don't know. But... I don't know. I, I feel like I have the same amount of interest in both of them. <laughs> uh, and I think because I've already played Hades and it's, it is essentially a known quantity. I'd probably give animal. Well, a chance first. That uh, makes sense. Cause that one to me is like, yeah, so weird, but I have been, I have been playing a different game based on hell. Uh, if I can bring it up real quick. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so I, yes. I just beat last night. I, I just beat last night a, a game called Indica uh, with a K, not a C. Uh, it is not about marijuana. Uh, <laughs> it is this, oh, right. this, oh with, man. With the, it, with the it, yellow, 
with a yellow font or whatever? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. And it's like it is trippy as hell. Uh I love horror. Uh, I love horror games. I love horror movies, all that kind of stuff. And like this was oh. like it's not pure horror. It's like real unsettling and uneasy and just has some really weird stuff in it. But the overall thing is like dealing with faith and hell and all this kind of stuff. And and then, yeah, like every once in a while it mixes in this little like a uh, eight bit art style stuff. I, I, I don't want to spoil any of it. It's it just like, it's just like a mood game. Uh, and there's not much yeah. to it. You know, I think some people would look at it and be like, yeah, it's a walking simulator. Eh, sure. Okay. But also it is a really, really good one of those. <laughs> so I, I liked it. That's my Very hell cool. game. <laughs> awesome. Um, so, uh, let's, uh, let's wrap things up with the lightning round and I can't believe that this is going in the lightning round, but it's been such a fun conversation. Nintendo switch Two leaks. Carrie, I know you got some hot takes on that. Oh yeah. I wanted to make a video about this. There's a lot of people that have just, I want to start it off, but I, I was really just worried about how many thumbs down I would get from just like really just people that were just already drinking the Kool-Aid. These people are never, never land. They've lost their marbles completely. <laughs> I keep on reading a bunch more things about like how oh this thing even in handheld mode is probably going to be like a Series S and they're like other people are joking. Isn't it funny that Microsoft made a Series S and then the Nintendo Switch Two is going to benefit from all that? And I was like, I, I can kind of see where you are, but you're also out of your mind. Um, and <laughs> the the thing that people are saying is they're just looking at the raw specs and not looking at anything else. The most important spec on the Nintendo Switch two super switch is the battery and no one knows what that is yet now it could be larger than the switch i could say that it'll be larger but how much larger do you think it's really going to be how much larger does anyone think the battery is going to be on the super switch this first one is a 16 watt hour battery that's less than half of the original steam deck uh this thing is such a tiny battery single cell battery that it's going to define what power limits are on this device so until we know that any other spec that you get is completely worthless because we don't know how what, what Nintendo is going to drive this at. So um, that's one part of it. The other part of it is that, like, you know, people are saying, well, this is going to be more powerful than a, a PS4, considerably more powerful than a PS4 in a handheld state. And that's also bogus. I think it'll be somewhere in the range of a PS4, maybe a little bit, quite a bit below a PS4 in a handheld state. But even with that being the case... God of War came out on PS4, and that game still looks amazing today. Yeah, it does. So when you think about what... Look at Luigi's Mansion 3. Luigi's Mansion 3 looks fantastic on the Switch. And think about what Nintendo is going to be able to accomplish with something that's far more powerful than the Switch. They're going to make things that are bananas go nuts in terms of image quality. And it's going to be something that I think when, you, when Nintendo really gets down to it and really does all their stuff, you know, front to back, that you're going to find it something image quality wise that is going to compete with stuff, even though it has no business competing with like mo modern video games in terms of image quality and what it's doing graphically. So that's like, there's like two angles to look at this. Number one, they're, they're out of their mind, out of their gourd, completely lost their mind. They're, they're in outer space and they need to come back down to earth. And then at the other time, games already looked good 11 years ago from a system from 11 years ago that um, we're starting to get diminishing returns with regard to a pushing fidelity. And I don't think we're going to get something like Hellblade uh, 2, uh, uh, Hellblade 2, that the latest Unreal Engine 5 yeah. game with all the bells and whistles. I don't think we're going to get anything that looks that good on a Super Switch. Like that is going to be that it's, it's cut off limit. But anything prior to that is going to run and look great on the Super Switch. So that's where we are. I think that the leaks are meaningless. They don't matter at all. And things are still going to look absolutely amazing for the Super Switch. So ultimately, it doesn't matter what I say. Things are still going to look fine. Uh, they're just, it just, it's just a weird conversation to be in. It's just like they're talking about nonsense. And I don't know. Adam, the, the, I get uh, oh, sorry. I thought you were, I thought you no, were wrapped I, up I am here. done. I'm okay. done. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Adam, you, I mean, you work for PC World. Are you in, in do, you, do you, do you care about Nintendo consoles or is you like, I'm just going to play on my PC? Oh, no. I, I mean, my first personal console was a Game Boy, the original Game Boy. Like, I love handhelds. Handhelds are like have always been my jam. And Nintendo. Yeah, I've I've always been down with Nintendo stuff. So yeah, I, I feel like it's the perfect complement to the PC. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> as opposed to like a PlayStation or an Xbox. Um, so 
Nintendo tweeted this out. They said, this is Furukawa, president of Nintendo. We will make an announcement about the successor to the Nintendo Switch within this fiscal year. Um, you know, editors note here that the fiscal year for Nintendo ends in March. So it could be next year, um, mm. like calendar year. Uh, it will... It has been over nine years since we announced the existence of the Nintendo Switch back in March 2015. We will be holding a Nintendo Direct this June to talk about our games. We're not going to be talking about the Nintendo Switch successor or the Super Switch. If I don't call it the Super Switch, Carrie yells at me. Um, so, boy, N Nintendo's about to have a real bad year this year, I think. They got, like, last year, there was, like, nothing to play. This year, I think that there's going to be nothing to play. And it's because they are doing exactly the same thing that they did with the Wii U. And it's smart that they're doing this. Right. They are holding all of their games back so oh, that yes. they can have that that first year banger after banger after banger like they did in 2017 with the Switch. Because every single month there was a huge game that would come to the Nintendo Switch. And that's why they sold 140 two million units so far um I, go ahead uh, carrie i think that you know the the june conference i think it might be good for them because i think they're going to just be talking about all the games that will be coming out like march 17th 2025 it's what like they got this left game, well i well i mean they're going to have like you know the next uh the next metroid next metroid prime 4 um so that's been in the wheelhouse for a bit uh, I don't know. There's there's a bunch of things that they can just come out with that it, it, they, ostensibly they need launch titles for the Super Switch, right? And right, but they're not going to talk about those. Well, they talked about the next Pokemon, and the next Pokemon is launching on the Switch and other con other Switch consoles or whatever, or it's like Switch consoles. I don't know. They, they pluralized it, and it's like March fifteenth or whatever. So it's like Pokemon is already launching on the Super Switch. They just didn't say it's launching on the Super Switch. They said it's coming out on that day. And I think when you when you talk about June and Nintendo, we're going to suspiciously see a lot of launch days of March 15th and March 17th, <laughs> 2025. And uh, they're like, oh, that, that's a Super Switch launch title. Oh, that's a Super Switch launch title. Uh, hmm. and even though it'll be playable on a Switch regular, which is wise of Nintendo to do, right? Like, it would be foolish. Nintendo made Breath of the Wild, and it was on Wii U and the Switch. That was super wise of them. It allowed people that had a Wii U to still play it, all 12 of them. And then everyone that wanted to get a Breath of the Wild for the Switch, they could get it. And for the 142 million people that have a Switch now, they could still play whatever new games are coming out, but that it'll also be Switch 2 compatible. Um, I think that's, you know, it's a wise, wise maneuver. And you're just going to have, you know, Nintendo's entering the realm of, uh, you know, smart delivery. Um, Russ, you got something to say? Mm -hmm. I saw you started. Yeah, I got lots to say. So uh, I think that Nintendo had a pretty good year last year. I mean, with Tears of the Kingdom and Super Mario Wonder, those are big releases. And I think we got some surprise drops like Metroid Prime Remastered, you know. Um, I When I play Mario Wonder on, on handheld, I'm like, it, it doesn't get any better than this. Like, how are they going to make graphics better than this? Like, that it was your game amazing. of the year last year, right? Yeah, and it's still it's probably my game of the year this year because I still am only like halfway through it. But um, yeah, like it's uh, it is like I just can't see it getting any better. So I don't care about the whole PS4 thing or whatever. Like I don't want to play modern games on my Switch. I mean, it'd be cool, you know, whatever. I don't know. Uh, the way I see it, it you know, it, it, launch time, you know, if they're coming out with new games, then yes. Put on like multi-platform releases like they did with Twilight Princess back with GameCube and Wii and then Breath of the Wild, right? Do something like that again, sure, with a new IP, but also make a remastered version of Breath of the Wild, make a remastered version of Tears of the Kingdom that like have higher frame rates or whatever happens to be that can take advantage of that soft or the hardware. And so, yeah, I don't know. I'm not, I, I it's so weird. It's been nine years or whatever it's been, but I'm still not super excited for a new one. Like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I like the way the Switch is right now. It doesn't really get any better than that in terms of the graphics and whatnot with the first person or first party games. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those guys who I'm not, not super stoked on the Super Switch unless there's some sort of title that I can only play on it that I'm going to be really hooked into. Right. Yeah, I, I am of the same belief. Well, <clears throat> Nintendo games already look fantastic on Switch. Like, they do. There's all, every, every one of them. Super Mario Odyssey, Luigi's Mansion 3. Uh, what game doesn't look good on the Switch that Nintendo? Mario Kart 8. Runs at 60 FPS and looks right. fantastic on the Switch. Like, it looks outrageous. I don't know how they're going to top Mario Kart 8. It's like, oh, we have 
4 million of people that you can choose from and 87 million tracks. Uh, you know, it's, it's an unreal package of Mario Kart. It is a definitive Mario Kart game. And I don't know how it's like, we made Mario Kart nine and it's like, well, what's in it? <laughs> like, what do you, what do you got there guys? Cause you're going to have to beat whatever the hell you got there before. And I, that's a tall order. That's a, that's a problem. That's like a, the, the Mac, the, the M M one problem of yeah. video games, right? Like Apple was like, Hey guys, uh, we let the engineers go nuts and they min maxed it to the max. And we made a fantastic machine. It's like, how do we get people to buy the next one? Oh, I know. Let's make it have eight gigs of system RAM so that they are, we just artificially make a stupid low barrier that will just have a bunch of dumb people buying that. Uh, like, Mario Kart 8 is a problem for them now, right? There's lots of things that I feel like are a problem. Smash, Smash. Brothers. Yeah. <laughs> I would say Smash, yeah. Yeah, all of these things that are like these super definitive versions, uh, like everyone is like flipping their lid over. They've made the bar so high for themselves. And it's like, oh, man, guys, oh, you really did yourselves a number with this one. Um, yeah. Do you so think it's possible they could just say, well, those are games as a service games. We just pour them, like, like they're just on the, the, like, we're just going to continue them onto the next system. I think like Russ is saying is that there is a lot of value that I think all all of us would love. If Tears of the Kingdom was just like, oh, we can run in 4K in a dock mode, right? Like it just looks fantastic on the Super Switch and it's a free, well, (laughs) maybe I'm getting carried away with myself here saying it's a free thing. (laughs) Probably going to need some like Nintendo Switch premium online membership to download uh, whatever update package for these games. But even then, that would be something that I think is worthwhile for whoever is like a Nintendo main. Um, I think that's that's a cool idea and something that they could entertain and do. Uh, I'm definitely going to get a Super... I'm I'm getting two Super Switches on day one. One for my, my son and one for me. So... Uh, I, they already have two hardware cells for, for me. My son has been saving up money for years now and he's ready to do a, probably what is going to be the last midnight launch for any console. Um, so I'm going to give him that experience. We're going to do that, but yeah, I'm, I'm right with Russ. Like there doesn't really need, obviously Nintendo could do a good job and they will. And the, the image quality of whatever game that they're going to make is look, going to look fantastic. And it's really just to give uh, more resources to other third-party devs that are making games that can't, like uh, Hogwarts uh, Hogwarts that came to Switch just looked atrocious. Maybe it won't look right. so atrocious on the, the Super Switch and things like that, which is a great thing for people that are only inside of the Nintendo ecosystem where they're going to be like, oh, other multi-platform games don't look like absolute garbage on this. And uh, that's good for me, which is great. Great for, great for them, and, and that's awesome. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting time. And, uh, I multiple, ultimately I'm just really interested to see with where, where they go with the next one, especially joy cons wise. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I just feel like they're out of new things to put out on the old switch. So they need a new switch so they can be like, all right, Here's our new Mario game. Here's our new this game. Here's the next Animal Crossing. And like putting those things out on the Switch, I feel like isn't going to make a lot of sense. But if they put them out on the next one, then yes. Um, But you know what? We will see. Um, One thing that I will say is that they have this. This is very interesting to me. Most of the time I haven't bought a new game on my Switch in a really long time. And Nintendo World Championship NES Edition this looks really cool. Um, yeah. Basically, yeah. it's it's like what was the what was the one that was on the Wii U and the um, NES Remix? Th- yeah, NES Remix. This looks like NES Remix, and mm-hmm. now you're going to be able to like play these games. Uh, I saw that you had pre-ordered like the physical edition, right, Carrie? Yes, I did. Yeah, I got it from Best Buy. Yeah, uh, you like are you you're hyped for this then? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for, I mean, yeah, so I, mostly like Nintendo releases, I still love getting the physical releases for. The Switch was like the last system that I was going to really buy physical stuff. I'm glad that they went with actual physical cartridges instead of like discs and stuff. Uh, so when they saw this and they saw like the gold cartridge, the, you know, whatever fake gold cartridge that it has, I was like, yes, that's something that I'm still kind of mad about. I was actually going to make a video of it. Uh, I was going to like paint my Breath of the Wild Switch cartridge gold uh, because it's like, how could you <laughs> not have a gold Breath of the Wild cartridge, Nintendo? This is a huge flub from you guys. Uh, and I wanted to correct the right, uh, you know, 
I wanted to correct a wrong that Nintendo had done there. I thought it would be a fun video, um, but I just never got around to it. Also, what it would be like two minutes? Like, I painted this gold. It, this is me painting it. There it is. Nintendo should have did it. See a little, like, you know what I mean? Like, um, how gold yeah. is it? <laughs> yeah. Look at the gold flex on this. It's like very, it's like, it. like, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, yeah so, I pre ordered it too. Nice. Did Physical you, you or, di- or digital? The physical, obviously, and uh, it's same thing. Like as soon as Carrie mentioned that it was on Best Buy, I'm like, all right, let me go to Best Buy. There it is, and so I bought it. And uh, yeah, I, I don't think I'm gonna enjoy this game because it's like speed running and you know, like all these challenges and stuff. I just want to play my I like I like cheats. You know what I mean? Like I'm not a speed running kind of guy. And so, um, but I yeah, I want it in my collection because I think it looks pretty cool. And NES is my favorite console of all time, so it's just a perfect mix. Yeah. Yeah. I went, it, I saw that you had pre ordered it, Carrie, and I immediately went to Best Buy and then I said, I don't need more crap in my house. So I, did, <laughs> I didn't buy it. Did you uh, pick this up, Adam? I didn't. No. I'm, yeah. I'm not much of a speedrunner guy. And I'm, I'm more of a, a Super Nintendo fan than an NES fan. So, mm. well, this is called NES Edition. So I'm sure that when the Super Switch comes out, we'll have um the snes edition and then you'll be you'll be ready to right plunk there. down some yeah, cash yeah. on that one <laughs> and uh we'll see a gold super nintendo cartridge instead of a gold uh nes cartridge yeah so weird that they made that gold of all the cartridges right like the the championship uh, cartridge i don't think there was a gold one they only had the gray ones with the little dip switches and they've yeah. made mm-hmm. this gold and zelda wasn't heresy <laughs> <laughs> was I, uh, Harry, was link was Link to the Past a gold cartridge? No, not for Super Nintendo, no. Okay. It, it was, was a the... gold um sticker. So it was a gray mm-hmm. it was a gray cartridge with a gold sticker. Gold and then sticker. on the N64, you could get a gray cartridge, but you could also get a gold cartridge for Zelda um from Toys R Us uh, Ocarina of Time. Also Majora's Mask. They were exclusive oh, yeah. to, they were exclusive to Toys R Us, which I bought it from. Uh so I have I still have my two gold n64 uh cartridges and yeah i had to get the gold ones but see even then toys r us knew what was up i feel like if to- toys r us was still in this we would have gotten it we would have gotten it <laughs> but then you know what's his name uh, i don't know the the company that like bought kb toy stores and just sucked all the money out of it and then killed kb and then did the same thing to toys r us microsoft oh i know i'm sorry no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it's just <laughs> some some banker or some investor that was like oh you guys got a lot of cash let me uh let me buy you and just take all that cash out cash myself out and then you guys can just like have the rest of it and just have a shell yeah uh, there's like things like in my mind that i would like if i had nothing else to live for there would be totally things that i would end the phrase with uh you know like i would I'm a Toys R Us kid, like something like ominous like that. <laughs> <laughs> this is a joke, obviously. This is a joke. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> All right. Uh, final, the final story for today. The In Rochester, New York, they have the Museum of Play, and they have the, um, the Gaming Hall of Fame. I've been to it a couple times. It's really cool. Uh, they they inducted some new games into the Hall of Fame. Uh, we've got, not on the screen because I screwed that up. There we go. We got Asteroids, uh, Mist, Resident Evil, SimCity, and Ultima. Um, here's my question to, to the panel. <clears throat> what game would you put into the Hall of Fame that's not in the Hall of Fame yet? Oh, I don't. I don't know what's in the Hall of Fame, so I'd have oh. to say, like, yeah, like, I mean, there's like some of them that I feel like should already be there. Like, Legend of Zelda should be in there. If it's not, that should be in there. Um, yeah, I'd have to take a look. Let me go ahead and take a look. Yeah, I'm at trying what's to find it now. I guess I didn't even think of that. Um, On that page, you can you can go down below. It says all inducted games and go by year. They're all over the place. So like last year, they inducted Wii Sports, The Last of Us, Computer Space. And Barbie fashion designer. That is like outrageous. Barbie fashion like, designer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's induct this game. What, what game? What was a? What's an early game? Like the first game? One of the first games ever made? Computer space? Yeah. Let's put that in there. Mm-hmm. What else? Uh, Last of right. Us. Yeah. Let's let's bookend these two things into the Hall of Fame. <laughs> like, <laughs> what's going on over there? Yeah. The year before that, it was Sid Meier's uh, Civilization. Uh, Sid Meier's Civilization. This is Pac-Man. Ocarina of Time and Dance Dance Revolution. So it's all over the place. 
Yeah, it's hard to I, say what everything everything's in there. I know uh, a buddy of mine works at the Video Game History Foundation, uh, Frank Cifaldi. Uh, oh, yeah. And he he had yeah he had a podcast where he he had on the the guy who who is a curator over at the Strong. I, I've never been there personally, but I, I believe they were talking about. Uh, like the the Hall of Fame inductee thing, and I, it's like one of those things where you just like submit a bunch of stuff, and then you like you know panels are voting on it. So I, I, yeah, I think it's just like oh wow okay well this got a lot of submissions, so it's mm. you know oh that makes sense. In, yeah, I wonder there, if so, uh, yeah. Barbie fashion designer made it last year because the movie like brought so much Barbie attention around, and so it was hot on oh, them. That's a possibility. Mind, you know? yeah. Also, I, yeah, the, there was another story around that specifically too. Like, uh, yeah. I video game history foundation I feel like had a had a good piece around that Barbie fashion design mm -hmm. one. I personally would really like to see EverQuest. Yeah. Uh, 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 on this list and it's not. World of Warcraft is and I mean deservedly so. World of Warcraft was the this juggernaut in the industry, but EverQuest no. like kind of kicked yeah. off the 3D MMO space, I feel like. So it was that's one, one that I would really like to see on there. Yeah. Yeah, it was a super big one. I, you know, there's lots of things that I love about EverQuest 2 that no one should ever do in a video game ever, but I really appreciate that they did it. Like the idea of like the, the thing that sounds great on paper, but terrible in a video game. It's like, all right, what if there's two continents, right? And we have a boat that like travels between them. That's how you get to the other continent. But the boat travels in real time. So if you miss the boat, <laughs> you got to wait 40 minutes. And everyone's like, yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> and then they did that. <laughs> so yeah, I have an experience with this where I was, I, I made a character, I made a dwarf warrior, right? And you start in one continent. And my friend made a uh, human something uh, on the other side of the of the world and so we were like we'll meet in the middle and so i'm hoofing it through the woods going towards the boat and people are yelling the, the boat's, boat's coming <laughs> like and it's in chat or whatever and i'm running as fast as i can and i get there just in time to see the boat leave and i was like well whatever it's fine this was back when i lived in hawaii russ lag Okay. Yeah. So Super the bad. bus gets there, or the bus, the the boat it's comes different. back after however long, <laughs> right? I get on the boat. I'm crossing the ocean. I lag out and fall off the boat, and end up <laughs> swimming for it. Feel it felt like hours. I don't know how long I was swimming for, and eventually I wow. just deleted that character and made a new character because <laughs> there was nothing that I could do. Um, <laughs> And that's that EverQuest. sounds terrible, but I'm nostalgic for that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. like Ever, EverQuest is a hardcore game. EverQuest is a game where you really needed a group of five. Everything you were doing, like even at like level ten, you're like, oh man, I'm just a, I'm just gonna get destroyed here. And I, uh, I played early on in EverQuest, uh, so there's like a big MMO phase that I had, like in '95, playing other mmos and when everquest came out i got i was i was plugged i've been plugged in for forever now but i was like oh everquest i'm gonna play this and i had a gnome necromancer and when everquest first came out necros were overpowered like crazy so you could like spawn your your skeleton and it was like the same level skeleton that you had was more powerful than an actual level 10 warrior that someone was playing as so it's like how does this make sense? You just, you, you're worse than my pet. And I also have a bunch of things. The Necro was like way overpowered. Like they had so many different powers. It was like, oh, I'm going to die. I cast Feign Death. And like, ugh. And it's like, oh, I'm not going to die. It's going to, my pet's going to kill this. And I'm like, wow, I have like, I have escape abilities. Uh, my pet's a super giant tank. Uh, I can dot things. It's like, wh why am I like the master of everything? And, and like, it was this most bizarre and then it turned out later on that if you gave your pet weapons because they could wield weapons and it didn't care what the damage of the weapon was only the speed of the weapon so fine steel daggers were the fastest weapon in the game and they weren't expensive to make so you could just give it two fine steel daggers and it would just be like and just rattling through people and it's like oh my god why is this thing so overpowered and you find people that would <laughs> necro was like one of the only class you could solo through all of everquest up to like level 50 otherwise everyone was like they needed a group of five just to survive it was the most hilarious thing and playing that i've always played necromancer for every mmo i played 
just hoping that there was like some balance issues for Necro in its favor. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's uh, the little fun fact of why I typically always play Necros. Awesome. Uh, even, nice. even, even like in Diablo. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, are you going to be playing Diablo 4's new loot thing there, Carrie? Oh yes, I saw about that. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a go. Um, I'm probably gonna be playing a bit more on Xbox side just so I can play on my couch. I found that that's like super comfortable to just kind of like be lazy and just kind of like go around. I'm not playing on hardcore mode on my Xbox though. I got a I played hardcore mode on PC where you know I'm like hunched over. I'm ready to <laughs> hot up. Um, but I got those achievements instantly. As soon as I as soon as I powered on the Xbox version, it brought my save over, started it up, and it's like, oh, you have a level fifth, well, level whatever hardcore character. Here's that achievement. Here's this, and here's that. And I was like, oh, sick! Thank you guys for uh, for recognizing nice. greatness. There you have it. <laughs> uh, so let's uh, wrap up the show, Adam. Uh, you've got a podcast. Tell everybody about your podcast and where they can find all of your stuff. Uh, yeah the the full nerd is our uh, PC World podcast about PC building and PC hardware. Uh, me coming on this show, like it's a crossover. We get we have it's like the full nerd nest. Is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's how I describe this crossover. Uh, I, I produce that show. Uh, real good time. Uh, we have the legendary Gordon Maung who hosts it. He's been in the the PC hardware space for decades, covering this stuff. So. Uh, he's fun. He's a, a wealth of knowledge, and we just talk about the the latest news for uh, for PC building and stuff like that. Uh, in that, um, we have a separate YouTube channel for that. It's it's a podcast anywhere you want to listen to it. Uh, but then most of the the normal I don't know quote unquote normal videos that we do is on PC World's uh, YouTube channel, uh, which is is what I manage. I, I manage both those. So, and yeah. your your keyboard stream that you're doing is that going to be on the full nerd or is that going to be on PC World? That'll be on PC World. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So the the full nerd actually the, the full nerd used to be on PC World's YouTube channel, but we just, I, I barely made that change to have it be a separate YouTube channel for algorithm and you know all that kind of stuff. So uh, we we just hit episode three hundred on the podcast, and now we're switching over to its own channel. Very cool. <laughs> Russ, yeah. what do you got coming up, man? Uh, so I have the, I just finished my uh, update video on the Lenovo Legion Go. It's kind of funny. Like I, you know, I kind of conceptualized the video before I made it and I thought uh, I'm going to title it. I keep trying to love the Legion Go because I keep trying to use this thing and whatever. But then I like got like new grips for it and got a couple other things. And then I like changed the title. I'm like, actually, I kind of love this thing now. And so now it's, I, I, I forgot what I called it, uh, you know, finally, but it was something along the lines of, I actually kind of love this thing now. And so that was a fun video to make. The next thing I have on the list is the uh, Ioneo Pocket S. So this is their like flagship Android device. Um, yeah, we'll see. I already did a video about this one, uh, the black model. It was like a pre-production unit. I had all sorts of feedback in terms of the physical things. Some of those have changed, a lot has not. And so, uh, but now I actually am allowed to benchmark it and do battery testing. They told me I couldn't do that before. And so now I can. And so um, that'll be my next video. And then we'll see after that. I'm not sure. By the way, if you don't want to spend any money, don't watch Russ's video about the Legion Go because I was watching his video and I immediately bought the little grippy things that you had posted. And then because it's through Etsy, my wife came upstairs and she goes, did you just order something on Etsy? And I was like, yeah, why? She goes, it came. I don't know how this happened. She got the notification on her shop app that oh, wow. I had bought the weird grippy things on Etsy. So I don't know how that happened, but you cost me money because I ended up buying you know, those, those grippies. I will say though, those grips are transformative. Like I, I, I don't know. I don't know any other way of saying it. It's the best $22 I've ever spent on a handheld, like any accessory ever. It, it, wow. it literally changes how you play the thing. You know how you accidentally press the buttons when you're holding the Legion go and stuff, it gets rid of that. It's got a, hmm. like, it actually feels like a handheld and it gets rid of all of that like sharp angle as well. Like it, it totally transformed it. Yeah. Anyway, those are, those are called gamer angles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I yeah. don't know what that means, Carrie. It's, it's just, I don't know. It's, it's required non pain. Yeah. Oh, yeah, required no, just, pain. Okay. Well, you know, it's the whole, uh, you know, 90s marketing that made no sense. It was just like extreme marketing for gamers for no reason. And all of a sudden, all PC gaming stuff is like hard angles everywhere and like extreme and to the max. And it's like, yeah. why? 
why is this happening? Who is in charge of this? Who does right. this? And it's just like, can't you just make something that like looks nice and work like feels nice? Does it have to have angles? I call them gang- gamer angles and it's, LEDs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah R- right. RGBs. Yeah, RGBs went nuts. Everyone, there's a lot of people that do like the RGBs though, and then they get done just like up in the ante. They're like, what if we made software that kind of joins? The, what if we just make the whole thing so that you everything you plug in RGB and it just is this big you know rainbow that is in unison. Uh, yeah, they, they went kind of off the wall with RGBs as well. You guys can't see. Like, I got a laptop sitting here next to me, and it's been flashing for three days because I can't figure out how to turn off the stupid <laughs> RGB stuff. And it just keeps going. <laughs> foom, foom, foom. That, and every time are... I sit down to do it, I look through the settings. and I'm like, I can't find it. And then I just walk away. Um, I hate RGB. Like, I, I say that with lights behind me, but that's for, like, you know, to Ambience. make the video look nicer. Um I just cannot stand when there's RGBs on everything. I love that there's no RGBs on the Steam Deck. Um, Carrie, what do you got coming up? Uh, I need uh, so Minis Forum sent me um, a Mini PC. It's an Intel based one. I'm going to probably go in a different angle with it instead of just like ripping Intel a new one, <laughs> a new one, the same one that I've been ripping into them forever now. Uh, so I'm going to just kind of like go at it at a different angle from like a productivity standpoint of like what to expect and mm. uh, just people that want it from there. So I think I'm going to do it of like, should you buy type of angle instead of, you know, a gamer ish angle. Uh, so I'm going to go on that uh, route. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff that I get a, a hold of, uh, but like Russ, I also have the INEO Pocket S, but I'll probably be a, probably a week away before I can get to that, getting that done. There's uh, That requires a bunch of testing. Fair. Well, uh, thank you guys for hanging out with us. Thank you to Russ and Carrie for joining, as always. And Adam, thank you for making this the full Nerd Nest. Uh, it was really great <laughs> well, having you on having the show. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it no, was awesome. I, I appreciate it. I was honored when you reached out, so thank you. <laughs> Get to hang out with some of my favorite people on the internet. All right. Oh, we're on. Stay <laughs> right, everybody. Bye-bye.